Thank you, Paris, for joining us today to hear more about behavior strategies and building relationships. I'm Steph Lundgren from ESU 8. And I'm Tony Earhart, the Clearwater Programs Director from ESU 8. So we're always happy to have you, um, Paris, here with us. Um, and this is a topic that we've heard a lot from you over the years that you'd like extra assistance with assistance, sorry, with strategies and ideas for um, how you deal with behaviors in the classroom. So um, here's just a little quote to think about the behaviors of students, but understanding the why a kid is challenging is the first and most important, important part of helping them by Dr. Ross Green. So we really need to understand the why of the behavior and honestly, there could be two same behaviors. So two students doing the same exact thing, but their why could be totally different. So we want to figure out the why in order to apply some of these strategies that we're going to talk about. Okay, so first up is behavioral strategies. And we're going to talk about RADAR. So R-A-D-A-R is a key concept in the MANT system. So it's an acronym, and you can see in bold, it is recognize, assess, decide, act, and review results. So as the Clearwater Programs Director, I'm in charge of CLC, which is our life skills program along with the behavior program for any of our schools to send students with behavioral issues um, to our school. So first off, when you are assessing behaviors in any student, whether they're in special education, general education, you need to have your radar on. So First of all, recognize the behavior. What are they doing? How are they acting? How long is the behavior? Are they harming themselves? Are they harming someone else? Then you're assessing it. Um, okay, now what? So what's the degree? Do they need to be moved? Do we need to move the other students? Um, what is the best way to go about this? Then you're going to act upon that. You're going to decide the D on what you're going to do okay, um, the student is throwing things and being physical, so I'm gonna decide to move the rest of the class rather than the student out. So now I'm acting upon it. I've made my decision and I'm acting. And then we always wanna review and debrief so we can decide and talk about, did we appropriately decide on that situation the best possible way? And if we didn't, that's okay. We learn from our mistakes, right? Um, if there might be some things we need to tweak here and there, but we always need to be improving ourselves and reviewing those results in order to better the students and ourselves too. And as a team, you guys can talk. So it's a very important part of addressing behavioral needs is reviewing your results. So debriefing. And then um, for more information on MANT, which is also a suggestion um, for students with behavioral issues, you can reach out to myself, Tracy, or Gina on MANT training. It's a two-day training. The first day is on de-escalation strategies, and the second day is on safe physical restraint. So if your school is interested in that, please feel free to email or call me. And then here's another acronym. So SODES, um, MANT refers to this as sodas, but we want it as sods because the advantages are before the disadvantages. So this is a strategy to implement to help develop effective ways of coping with situation. So it's your guide to problem solve. Um, kind of like before, you're going to go through this and you could do this with staff or with students. Um, just remember if the student's highly escalated. So if they're at their point they're throwing, they're hitting, they're physical. That is not the time that they're able to problem solve. They need to de-escalate a little bit more and able in order to have those strategies and skills to be able to really think through. So you're going to want to try to use this with students before they get to the top of the crisis cycle or after they've already de-escalated. A lot of times with our students in the behavior program, they're already very highly escalated. So we wait until they're in the de-escalation process and they have to do this before they go on to their next activity. So for example, you're, you're gonna think of your situation. So 
um, student is fleeing or running, what would be the options that the student flees the classroom? You could um, use movement. So yourself, the teacher, you're using body movement to distract him away from or her from the door. Maybe you have locked doors. Maybe it's a smaller environment. So think of all your options. Then you're going to think of the advantages before the disadvantages because we want to look at what are the advantages. We want to look at the positive side. So you're going to list the pros and cons to the situation, and then you're going to make your solution. So, um, and then you decide on that. And then you'd want to debrief on that later on too. But so the student can do this, or you can do it as a staff member. And on the next slide, Steph, I think I listed some problem solving worksheets. So for example, this is our process on paper. So like SODE's on paper. So after our, one of our students goes through this or has a big moment where we feel like they really need to problem solve, we want them to figure out what they would do differently next time. So they fill out the student behavior action plan. So that is actually the one on the left is the one that we use at the behavior program. And again, we do it when the student is calm and ready to answer. They can answer it paper, pencil, or you can um, write it down for them. Some of our students, um, their writings, maybe not the best, or they can verbalize better than what they can write. So they have us write it and that's totally fine. So you can do that one. There's a couple other calm down worksheets there as examples. And then on the next slide too, there are uh, three more, I believe. On... And we did those, we, we used some of these at some of my schools. We did call them think sheets. Um, and we did always wanna make sure that the kids were calm and could think rationally again um, through that situation, um, but not wait too long so that they didn't remember the situation anymore. Um, when yeah. we've had different trainings with um, Sonia Suckup, which Paris always love a day with Sonia, she talks about when kids flip their lid and that's not the time um, to be talking through things. We have to get them back, calm down, and then they can think through. Um, we also did like to share these with parents so that parents could kind of think through um, your or be informed of some of the behaviors and then see those solutions also that the kids were coming up with. Okay. So now we're just gonna go through some strategies um, on different behavioral strategies that you can use. And again, with students with behavioral issues, you want to be consistent, but yet you also want to individualize it with the student. So this is gonna be a wide variety of strategies that you will have to use radar to decide um, how you're gonna react to the behavior. So if it's verbal, you wanna be short, you're not gonna be very lengthy. You wanna be clear and specific. You wanna be aware of your tone of voice. Um, as we know, if someone is um, yelling very loudly at us, that kind of makes us escalate a little more with them. We wanna be aware of our nonverbal skills because students can pick up on that very easily. And we wanna explain expectations. And this one, I feel like, we take a little bit for granted. We assume the students know what is expected. We assume in music to art, to grade level, to special education room, they all know what to do, but sometimes our expectations are different. So we need to make sure in our classroom or whatever environment, the expectations are posted and the students know what is expected of them and what's gonna be the consequence if they don't follow those expectations. And if you any think, of you Tony, are... when sometimes when kids get really upset that they forget those expectations. Yep, definitely. When they start to lose it. Mm -hmm. Yep, so they may need reminders. Yeah. And then um, I do see this where sometimes it becomes a confrontation or battle. We're the authoritative figure, so we want to win the battle and an argument may happen. And that's one thing I would say refrain from, walk away, ignore. But if 
you're trying to explain something to the student um, and they're getting mad and you're just going back and forth. You may not think it's an argument, but if you're going back and forth and the volume's getting higher and higher and there's no solution, that's an argument. So please walk away um, and then come back with the student. Is there ever a time you, you could, like if a student starts to question you or um, kind of start that argument with you, can you just not answer the things that they're saying? Could you just ignore yep. Yep. Or go get a teacher or maybe another pair has a different relationship with that student that they could help too. Okay. And then be honest. Um, don't make promises that you can't keep. Sometimes when we are trying to de-escalate a student, we may be throwing out some bribery things, but if you cannot follow through with it, um, don't promise those things. So those are just some simple verbal strategies to use. So I'm thinking about those nonverbal skills too, like things like standing with your arms crossed or pointing your finger at someone. Are those things that might um, agitate the student more? Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Great question. Sometimes um, Sonia would also talk about getting down on a kid's level instead of yep. kind of talking over them. And then this goes along with your listening skills. So... Um, when we're listening, we need to have active listening and to show that you're an active listener, you can paraphrase so you can rephrase what they've said. And you can also use nonverbal cues, shaking your head. Um, you could say, mm -hmm, okay, eye contact. But sometimes we think we're good listeners when in reality, we just want to go, go, go and get going on and not listen. So we really need to make sure when we're working with students with behavioral issues, that they feel that they are heard and we are listening to them. And then reflective listening is very similar, but you're listening, you're analyzing it, and then you're reflecting it back. Um, I understand that you feel this way, or I think you are feeling this way, or this is what I heard, and then they're going to answer you back to see if you're on the same page. So you can use this again with adults or students, but this is just so the communication is all on the same page. Do you have anything to add, Steph, on listening? Um, no, I just think that we need to not be afraid to take the time to listen. Um, sometimes you just want to get the kid through the situation because we're in such a rush in schools and sometimes just slowing down to, to listen and give them the time that they need is so important. Yep. This one, I think, can be used very, very often. So I think this one isn't given enough credit. So this is choices. And we suggest give three choices so that you're not, it's either or. So you're giving three. So it gives you control and the student. But here's the deal. Sometimes the student just thinks they have the control, right? Because they can be very, very similar. So if you're trying to get them to do a grammar worksheet and the student's like, I am not doing that, but you know they have this cool pen that they love working with and rarely get to use it, you could say, okay, how about we do this worksheet, but you get to choose if you want to use your pen, pencil, or marker. Um, or um, if you have this option to accommodate worksheets or take breaks with it or do a few problems now and then later, you could say, okay, we have this math worksheet. You get to choose which five you want to do first, or maybe you'll allow them six or seven. So how many do you want to do? Maybe they say seven, but probably they'll say five. Um, but you're giving them options. Again, maybe they have a pile of paper They've been um, misbehaving throughout the entire day and they've got this stack of worksheets to get caught up on. You give them the option. They can all be very similar. Maybe there's a math facts worksheet. Maybe there's a regular math worksheet that they do. And then maybe there's a math activity too. So you're giving them choices, but again, you still have some control in it. So I do think we need to really look into how we can apply this choices in many different things with these students. 
some of my students needed um, breaks often um, if class was kind of overwhelming. So I would even say, do you want to walk out and um, get a drink before you do your worksheet or after you do your worksheet? Yep. Um, and they would they would pick that. Um, in one of my classrooms, we had sensory boxes. And if a student was feeling agitated, he'd say, I need to go get my box. And okay. I would say, well, there's a timer in it. Do you want to set the timer for three minutes or four minutes? And oftentimes he'd say three minutes will be just fine. Yeah. You know? Good. And visuals. Um, students often, if um, we look back on what we just talked about at when students are highly escalated, they're not thinking clearly and they're not able to problem solve. So adding a visual, you're adding another piece to how we learn helps them. Okay. These are my choices. These are my expectations. So many students do like a visual schedule. So that would be a picture um, of what they're doing throughout. And that's showing them, this is where you go. This is where you go next. It's showing them the time. It's showing them what's expected. And then you can have your expectations, your rules, and you can do that with pictures also so that they know. And then you could do consequences. Um, students need to know if this happens, then this is next, okay? If I flee in the hallway, then I have to do this. What is your consequence at your school? So a this and then chart with a visual. And there's so many things out there that you can use visuals for and um, choice boards and lesson picks, and you can make it age appropriate. So you can use Velcro strips when they're little, you can make it older when they're more, um, more appropriate when they're older and then visual choice of breaks. So this stuff may come into play. Like, um, some students have choices of, if it's like a sensory box, a walk, a drink. So those are the things you would list on that choice of breaks. And then there's also social stories. If a student's having a certain behavior happening repetitively, you could make a social story explaining um, the expectation and what you want the student to start doing. Yeah, so social stories can almost be considered like um, like um, the frames in a in the cartoon section of the newspaper, right? You, like you can have some frames showing what will happen and explaining what will happen. So, um. Like if you just want kids to learn how to walk into the room appropriately and get out their work, it would have, you know, them walking calmly into the room, putting their backpack away, sitting down their desk with their pencil out or something like that. So it would explain out um, some situation for them. And I think every kid, I mean, lots of kids uh, appreciate that visual schedule and expectations and things. This is good for all kids, not just kids that we're worried about with behaviors, but this can help, you know, the whole class with behaviors. I had one student who, if I forgot to put the schedule up, would always say, when are you going to write that? I need that to be out today. You know, he just wanted to um, prepare for the next thing in his own mind. So And then um, next, we're going to talk about BIPs. So BIPs are behavior intervention plans or FBA's functional behavior assessment. And these are things I talk about quite often. However, I think it is so important for the paraprofessionals to know some of these things about students if they have behavioral issues. So oftentimes, the staff that is working most often with these students don't get to see the IEP or the BIPs or the FBAs. Um, and you guys need to know this information because you're working with these students daily and it would help educate the student. So therefore, um, if you aren't offered this information and you have a student that is having many behavioral issues and they're on an IEP, more than likely they may already have a BIP or FBA and I would just ask you to ask your special education teacher and say, hey, um, is this student on an IEP and do they have this? If so, can I look at it or can you tell me a little bit more about it? Um, this is a plan that basically like lists 
what are the strategies and skills and the things we're going to do to help the student with their behavior? And what are we going to do to help them be successful? And then the FBA is the why. So like that quote that I talked about, the FBA figures out, is it attention seeking? Is it they want a tangible prize? Is it what is the reason? Is it they're escaping from it? So what is the reason they're having this behavior? So I feel like this is crucial information that you would want to know. So please ask on this. And then with that behavior intervention plan, the whole staff should be implementing it with fidelity so we can see if it works. We want to use data to see if all those strategies and everything in there is working. And we want to be as consistent as possible. And then we also want consequences and rewards. So many of our schools use um, PBIS or positive behavior, which is awesome and a great way to promote good behavior. However, sometimes we leave out the consequences. So just because we are um, implementing a lot of PBIS strategies, if a student does something so severe, um, they still need a consequence because in life we have consequences and we need to teach these students also that because you did this and that behavior was so harsh, this is your consequence. But in the meantime, you're using some of those PBIS strategies and you're positive when the student's behaving positively. So you always want to reward and really praise them for acting appropriately all the time. But just don't forget consequences also. But That's also something. when we're having consequences, Tony, I mean, the old way would be to really get chewed out, to really get yelled at about that. Yep. Is that is that what's effective? No, nope, we want to teach the students how to behave. Yeah. So, um, you know, if we didn't know how to do a math problem or if we didn't know how to read a word, we'd be taught how to do those things. So we also need to teach students how to behave. And yep. um, I know in my classroom, um, even though I wasn't working with special ed students on this, if I had a student that was having a really hard time with behaviors, we would make our own little behavior plan. It wasn't as formal as this um, and as, as written up, but usually um, it really called to to attention that behavior and students were able to work through it really well throughout the days and weeks and even months. Um, it kept them on track and I think they felt more successful. Definitely. I'm glad, glad that you brought up the data tracking piece. If you want to go back, mm -hmm. sorry. Sure. Ben. Yep. Um, because with these plans, you want to track the data because you can maybe see patterns on if it's during a certain class period, is it morning, is it afternoon? And you want to be able to assess if your behavior plan or whatever your team has decided is working or if it needs to be tweaked a little bit. Um, and then, yes, just on the consequences. So just remember, um, there should be a consequence. However, like Steph said, use all these other strategies too because you can use the problem solving worksheet. You can use a lot of those to help teach the students how to be behave correctly. And we can and still we'll talk to kids, right? With respect and dignity through all that. Definitely. Um, oh gosh, I was thinking of one more thing, but it's eluded me. <laughs> um, okay. I don't know. It'll come back. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to continue on with just overall strategies to implement. Um, there's no rhyme or reason of these in order, so I will just talk a little bit through them. But again, so you have to do what works for the student. Unfortunately, although we say be consistent, students that have a lot of behavioral issues and episodes, what works one day may not the next or vice versa the next week or the next week. So we really have to be creative in just trying many strategies to help the students succeed. So ignoring, if it's attention seeking and it's, it's a negative behavior you don't want to see, um, ignore. We've had to have a lot of conversations with our staff because we have a bigger staff and there are students that are attention seeking. And so if they are having a behavioral issue in the hallway and have supervision and the one person is fine with them. That is fine. The one person is supervising. 
Um, they just kind of give the people in the hallway that are going by a look that they're okay. Otherwise, we found out what was happening. Every person was coming by saying, hi, how are you to that person? And it was reinforcing that behavior to escalate and to go out in the hallway and keep escalating um, so they could be out and talk to everyone. So um, ignoring is a strategy that works. Distraction. Distraction, if you know something um, that they like to talk about, if you see something on the wall, you could try to distract them to get them um, calm down more. Movement, if the student moves with you or will walk or go to a different room with you, you can use movement. Sometimes you may have to move your class or everyone else if the student's not able to move, but if the student will, you can move them. Create a safe place. So this would be if you'd have a physical um, or a student that would need to be removed, you can create a safe place. We call them our cool down rooms. So students that are hurtful to themselves or others have to be in the cool down room and um, they have to fill out that problem solving worksheet when they are cooled down and then they get to come back out. So I had one student who um, um, had autism and he would get um, kind of, you know, his senses were heightened and he loved to dive into um, the special ed teacher's pile of um, stuffed animals and pillows. And he'd say, lay them on me because it felt good to have that pressure. So his safe place was even a little bit different, but he knew that that's where he could go when he was um, feeling the heightened senses. Yes. Time, um, time can be hurtful or harmful, whether, um, what we need to get done or if their buses are ready to pick them up and they're having a episode. However, just remember that you can wait things out and then the students can always make up that work during a different time. But sometimes we just need to use our patience to let the students deescalate. Because remember, most of these students don't have these skills and strategies. Otherwise, they wouldn't be behaving like this. So we are here to teach them how to behave correctly. So you can use time. Positive feedback is just um, like we talked about earlier with when they do something you want to see, you're going to give them clear, specific, positive feedback on what they were doing. Good job good job on what. Um, So you're more specific and descriptive. I like the way you're sitting with your um, feet on the floor and your eyes on the board. So it's more specific. Walking. um, Some students may deescalate if you take them for a walk. If you're able to with supervision and staffing, you may walk with them. And humor. Um, You may be able to add a joke or do something funny to get the student distracted and laugh, to get them away from whatever they were upset about. Okay. All right. And then we have some more. So again, those expectations, a lot of times we assume students know the expectations. They've been at this school for years. They know what to do. Well, We don't always expect the expectations in reading or math. So we need to teach what do we expect from these students. We need to have them posted. We need to review them, teach them, and then have them practice even some of those expectations on how to behave correctly. Uh, Gain the student's trust. So Steph will talk about building relationships later. But if you have the student's trust, it's going to make it so much easier to be able to de-escalate students because they have that trust with you. You could talk about what they love. So this is kind of like a distraction also. If you know there's something they're really interested in, you could see if you could get them to talk about that instead of what they're focused on that's making them upset. You can offer food or drink that may give them a break that they need. You could give them three choices that are similar that you think that they would um, choose rather than what they were engaging in now in the negative behavior. 
Um, just something to think about. Avoid overreacting. So if they see your reaction, that may escalate them even more. So try to stay calm. Again, do not engage in argument. So if you're going back and forth because the students escalated, remember you need to stop and walk away. And we need to really show empathy because just remember, we're here to teach these students and um, they need help in order how to behave correctly. Otherwise, they'd be doing it. Also, um, you can engage in different senses. So sometimes we will say, hey, can you um, find something that's the color red? Can you tell me what you smell now? Can you walk over and touch that blanket? So you're engaging them in different senses, which is trying to like trigger them off of what they're escalated about. So you're trying to change that direction for them. Cool down strategies are just strategies to relax. There's many out there. Um, you can Google cool down strategies. This is where you could make cool down strategies a visual for it. There's breathing. Um, we have like whale breathing, um, dragon breathing. Um, there's different sensory needs out there for students. Um, and an occupational therapist may be able to help more with that if they're on an IEP. Um, you could have them freeze. There's fidgets. Um, there's a lot of different cool down strategies out there. Teleheads or pre-corrections are proactive reminders that help students remember. So this is when you're not assuming you're like, remember to be safe, respectful, and responsible. And remember, we walk on the right side of the hallway. So you're reminding them so that they have that in the back of their head and they know what the expectations are. So I had a student who would have a hard time at art class every time he went to art class. <laughs> and um, uh, before he went in, I'd say, what are some things you need to remember today? And he'd say, well, um, that doing my best is okay. And I'd say, well, what happens if you get frustrated? And he goes, well, I can just say that I need a break or I can count up when I walk to the water fountain and count down as I walk back. Um, or, you know, things like that. And he would think through, um, those, those things he should remember and, um, and like <laughs> common frustrations for him. Good. And then specific praise or positive feedback is when you give that descriptive feedback stated positively. So, like I said earlier, just really stating what it is that you like the student is doing. I like that you're sitting so quietly um, waiting for your friends to get finished on their worksheet. And then consistent interactions with the student is here's the relationship building piece. You want to be enthusiastic and positive because students really can tell if you're engaged and care about them and positive about whatever you're working on. Yeah. We don't work hard for the people we don't think like us, right? So if we think they don't like us, we're not going to work very hard. Yep. So a little bit about PBIS, positive behavior intervention systems. Um, we want to teach and model our behavior expectations, and we want to review those often. And then remember the five to one rule, the five reinforcements to one correction. Um, the staff at CLC is working on figuring out bracelets so that they're always aware of doing five positives to one correction. So there's going to be beads that they can move. I've also seen lanyards so that you can move so that it's always in our heads that we really need to do this. And then we want to use that common language so we're all on the same page and build those relationships. It's so important to build those relationships. Yeah, you know, I could feel the difference in my classroom when I taught if we didn't have that five to one positive to negative. Um, and remember, as simply as saying a kid's name right? Um, if I just was um, correcting them or telling them to stop talking by saying their name, that was a negative. So, um, but I could feel the mood in my room when we were on more negatives than positives. Yep. So just remember with the big concept, a child who can't behave, if a child doesn't know how to read, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to swim, we teach. 
If a child doesn't know how to multiply, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to drive, we teach. So if a child doesn't know how to behave, do we teach or do we punish? So just remember that we want to give these students the opportunity to learn and give them the strategies and skills that they need to know how to do. So it all starts at the core and you want to definitely start in the classrooms on what's expected and how to behave um, and then layer on those extra supports of those strategies, just like you would in reading or math. So you need to start with everyone first on how to behave appropriately. Yeah, thank you, Tony, so much. So much to think about and remember um, for behavior intervention strategies. Yep. Reach out if you have any questions. In the meantime, my email's on here. Or you can call the school also um, with any questions. So thank you for letting me um, share just some little simple behavioral strategies with you guys. Awesome. Well, what goes hand in hand with behavior is um, building relationships. And so we'll talk about that just a little bit here. Tony started with that. Um, so Tony talked about some kids that were seeking attention and sometimes it was persistent and sometimes in her setting, it's a very severe thing. But um, sometimes we um, we can see the other side of that. So I often hear people say that a child is always looking for attention or that um, that person always has to be the center of attention, but people aren't seeking attention. They're seeking attachment. Um, children who do not feel seen or heard sometimes learn to scream loudly, not for attention, but for, but for attachment connect and connection. And that's what we all want. It's what we all need. So how can we, um, give them that kind of connection to people at schools? I'm going to move our pictures just a little bit here. Um, so the benefits of connection, and this comes from PBIS as well. Um, we'll go ahead and move that there. Okay. Building relationships with students is one of the most critical aspects of teaching. Everything flows from this relationship. The trust and cooperation learned from positive connection with your students will play out in every aspect of your school day. This connection can lead to efficient classroom routines greater student confidence, and increased academic achievement. Though a, series of, um, though a series of small, thoughtful, uh, intentional gestures, um, I think that's supposed to say through, through a series of small, thoughtful, intentional gestures, you can build positive relationships with your students. For some, this may be the only positive interaction they have with adults each day. Your students want you to know or want to know that you care for them. Building relationships with students will help them to know that you do. So just remember, not every kid has positive relationships everywhere in their life. And they're looking to you um, to be one of those um, close um, people in their lives. So um, I think parents have a um, special uh, connection with kids, you get more one-on-one -on -one moments with them to build those relationships. And sometimes you get to work with kids from year to year to year. Um, and so building that relationship really can help. There's another statement that says, where there is no significant relationship, there is no significant learning. So we learn from the people that we like and that we know like us, with the ones that we know care about us. Okay, so some strategies here are hello and goodbye. So greet your students um, each day and make sure that you you say hello to them. You know, if you can even be in the hallway to greet kids as they're walking in, that's great. Also be there to say goodbye, have a good night. Um, I used to stand at my door and do hugs, high fives, and handshakes for each kid. Um, but um, just we want kids to feel welcome when they walk in, but also like they'll be missed when they're gone. Uh, maybe that's even you, something you tell a kid who misses a day of school. Boy, I really missed you yesterday. I'm glad you're, that you're back with us. Um, and if you can, use students' names in these hellos and goodbyes. Um, they know that they're seen and heard and um, that someone knows them at school. Also, um, begin with the end in mind. So um, think about your expectations. And when you start out the year, or maybe you're having new kids in a reading group or a new um, set of kids you're going to pull out to work on a certain skill, 
let them know your expectations or your rules um, right away and get those down. Once they do, the whole time that you spend together will go smoothly because of that. So you won't be battling behavior so much because they've already heard what's expected of them. And they know that that's going to be the same rule the first day and the last day. Okay, so also find out what's on their playlist. Okay, not just their playlist, but what are their interests? So it could be, what's your favorite song on your playlist right now? Or it can be, what sports do you play? Or what do you like to do when you go home? What are your interests? What cartoon do you watch? What cereal is your favorite cereal? Whatever it may be, we just want to find out um, a little bit about the students and then ask them about it. I remember having kids in my classroom that were so into Pokemon or something that I honestly was not interested at all, <laughs> um, but I had to figure it out. I had to find it out. Like I remember kids who loved certain cartoons and I'd watch an episode so that I knew something about, about it so that I could talk to them about that thing. Um, if you can, and, and you know, you have it in your time, go to one of their ball games when they see you there, they will feel like a million bucks because you were, you took time out of your schedule to see them. Um, so when we can attach to their interests, it'll help. And then we have to think about social emotional learning. So some of our students um, need to work on self-awareness, um, self-management, social awareness, um, relationship skills, responsible decision-making, all those things. And like we said, those have to be taught we can't just expect them. And then we don't also take it personally when we don't see them. We try to teach them. We also want to walk, walk and talk, right? Walk the walk and talk the talk. If we expect it from kids, we better be showing it ourselves, right? So we're going to model these great behaviors. If we want kids to be respectful, we're also respectful. We talk respectful to each other. We don't talk behind kids' backs, right? Um, uh, we might pull them aside to correct them instead of doing it in front of all their peers where they might be embarrassed. Um, so again, walk the walk and talk the talk. We're going to stay really positive in our voice so that they stay positive in their voice. But also give kids a voice, right? Um, uh, share what's going on in your life and have them share what's going on in their life. Ask them, how are you doing? What'd you do this weekend? Um, kids that feel um, seen and heard um, just feel like, gosh, you care about me. You, you want to know about me. Um, actually, there's some research done and kids were asked, how do you know when your teachers care about you? And the kids said things like, well, they ask me about my life and they come to my games and they, you know, they take an interest in me. And then they turned around and asked the teachers, how do you show kids that you care for them? And the teachers say, well, I work long hours and I grade their papers. And that just doesn't translate to the kids. Yeah, we work really hard and we show up every day for them, but they want to know you care by asking them about themselves. Okay, so place a good call. That's the best call to make, right? It's really hard to call parents and tell them the, the not so great stuff. Um, but if you could call parents and say, I want to tell you what awesome thing your kid did today, all the better. So sometimes you might want to check with your principal or teachers and say, hey, I'm going to make this phone call. Is that all right? Um, what I even like more than a good call sometimes is writing a note home and sending it in the mail, because where does that note go? Um, go, Tony, if you got a note home about your kid, where might it hang at home? Oh yeah, she's muted right now, but it might hang on the fridge. I think fridge. I could read your yeah. lips there or on yep. a bulletin board or somewhere like that. Or the kid could yep. put it, um, you know, in their own room and say, gosh, my teacher really saw what I was doing and my teacher's proud of me. Um, so I, I, I've had kids work harder for this one thing. Um, some of my most challenged students behaviorally have worked their tails off because they just want me to call home and tell their parents that they're doing a good job. Yes. Cause on the other side, Steph, oftentimes those kids are getting the calls about the bad behaviors that their kids are doing. So then when you do find something that they do good, it feels so good to hear that. And then also that parent's going to reinforce that at home with their kid. 
Mm-hmm. So yes, we want you guys to be honest, but um, also if they are doing good things too, we need to remember to have those shout outs and celebrate those. Parents appreciate it so much that sometimes they might say, oh my gosh, it scared me to death when I saw the yeah. school number coming across the phone, like what they yep. do now. Yep. Um, so parents almost need that five to one as well. Like they need to hear the good stuff. Yep. Let's give it yep. to them. Great. Yeah. And then be a listening voice for our kids. Our kids have a lot going on in their lives. And if when we can sit down and listen to them, it's so good. And it's not always to give advice or it's not always to tell them to do. They might just need to talk to you and just have somebody who will listen. Um, And so I think we all need that in life, but um, kids who are going through a lot need that. So they'll know that they can trust you. You build that trust, that relationship. Kids will do anything for you. So I think this is like um, one of the number one skills a parent could have is developing those great relationships with their students. So I can't wait to hear all of your stories about how you're, you're really working with your kids and how they, you know, that they can trust you. All right, everyone that brings us to the end today. um, But I just want to remind you that we will be back in February to talk about digital citizenship and how to practice um, good skills when we're online that keep us safe and um, keep us honest and all those good things. So JC, um, our tech integrationist, will be joining us and we'll have another tasty Paraskill tidbit with me that day. All of our resources are available at bit.ly slash pairs of ESU8. So we have all of our um, presentations and all of our recordings for several years of these trainings. Um, some of the best days are spent with you, Paris. So thanks for joining us today. If you ever need anything, please just email. Thanks, Tony, for joining us too. Yes, thank you for letting me join. And I wish you a great year and thank you paraprofessionals every day for what you do and the difference that you're making in children every day. Yeah. Happy holidays, everybody. Go enjoy it. Um, Enjoy that break and that time to recharge. We'll see you in the new year.